Willie the Kid, and there is nothing you can do about it. The beginning of Halloween the 13th is not Michael Myers killing this radio DJ. Also, Comcast. Also, 52 seconds of logos. In case you confused it with Haddonfield, Virginia. There are three of them living in this house, and they have this many goddamn stairs. I don't know if that's a sin or not, but it should be. Jeremy! Jeremy. I'm gonna put the candy on the porch. Trick-or-treat kids can help themselves. Trusting trick-or-treaters not to empty the entire bowl, and thus forcing the hand of future trick-or-treaters to egg and TP your house relentlessly. Since last Halloween, all the events and, you know, the headlines of Michael Myers. So wait, are you telling me that Haddonfield still has a robust amount of trick-or-treaters the very next year? Michael Myers wasn't even caught or killed in 2018, despite the tremendous efforts of Anthony Michael Hall, and his murders are well documented to occur on Halloween. What the f*** are kids doing out trick-or-treating the very next year? This babysitter isn't going to jail for showing his thing to kids. Also, showing John Carpenter's The Thing is a fun homage to the kids watching the original The Thing in the 1978 Halloween. But it also just makes me want to go watch this movie instead of the rest of Halloween Ends. No, you're scared. I'm 21 years old, I don't get scared. Yeah, there's nothing to be scared about at 21. Just, you know, figuring out what you're gonna do with the rest of your life, learning about taxes, hoping that condom breaking didn't make you a 21-year-old father, you know. Nothing scary. Okay, that's actually pretty disgusting and probably not appropriate for kids. This scene they're watching in The Thing comes in around one hour and 15 minutes into the movie. And while it's probably the grossest part, you've already seen more than enough gore and ickiness to make this determination well before this point. And I don't really feel like pretend- Kids. Leaving zucchini bread out like this. Do you want stale zucchini bread? Because this is how you get stale zucchini bread. And ants. This isn't funny, Jeremy. Real life interaction with CinemaSins commenters makes it into the movie. I don't blame Corey for exercising caution here, but I do blame him for taking a methodical horror movie pace up the stairs when Jeremy yells like this. Cut! Movie will try to make you believe that when Corey kicked this door, that he was able to supply enough force to jettison Jeremy over this railing and fall to his death. But I carefully examined the height of this railing and its distance from the door before Corey even walked into the room, and I've determined that there is no way any such thing could possibly happen. So there. Surprise! This movie doesn't start with a Michael Myers killing, it starts with a good old fashioned prank gone wrong death perpetrated by an asshole kid, his gullible babysitter, and a faulty floor plan. That's the way to subvert audience expectations, by completely taking Michael Myers out of the equation! It worked for Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, it'll be a tremendous success for this third Halloween movie. What have you done?! Accusing your 21 year old babysitter who's holding a knife and said, I'm going to kill you Jeremy just as you walked in the door of wrongdoing. Squash on squash, squashing. It took four writers to come up with a way for Halloween to end. Haddonfield was a peaceful town. And then one Halloween night many years ago, all of that was lost. Wait, are you talking about the night Michael killed his sister? Or are you talking about the night 15 years later after he broke out of Smith's Grove? And how could either of those incidents be the moment where all was lost? Did Haddonfield become a hotbed of murder in the 40 years after Michael was sent back? The movie's about to make a point that Haddonfield has become a violent place since 2018 when Michael escaped and went on a rampage, which makes a whole lot more sense than pinning it on either 1963 or 1978. Michael Myers was pure evil. He took our dreams and turned them into nightmares. <laughs> movie confuses Michael Myers with Freddy Krueger. And Haddonfield was once again forced to confront this man in a mask. A Friday the 13th style killing recap in a Halloween film. Friday the 13th was supposed to have stolen from you, Halloween franchise, not the other way around. Although if Michael Myers goes to Manhattan in the next film, I won't be upset. His senseless brutality ravaged my community and killed my daughter. Just going to go ahead and sin this f***ing franchise again for killing off Judy Greer. And then he vanished. This is a big part of this movie's mythology, that Michael Myers just quit getting a murder boner on his favorite holiday for the next four years. It never gives any kind of explanation as to why this is occurring. We're just supposed to roll with it, and I will not be rolling with it. There isn't anything inherently wrong with these newspaper articles for once, but I do find it curious that all of them were written by some anonymous staff writer. Industrial grinder foreshadowing. It's my 110th least favorite kind of foreshadowing. It's just below mystery meat foreshadowing and right above ant farm foreshadowing. Hey, Corey, you're late! You're late again! I am sure Corey's lateness will be a devastating plot point on which this entire movie plot will rest. This boogeyman's been sitting in hibernation, but trust me, y'all, he'll be back! If Willie the Kid is the late-night DJ for WURG 94.9, then why is he broadcasting in what is clearly the morning? Camera pans over to show us an ominous sewer tunnel, where I guess Michael Myers has been spending his days cosplaying as Pennywise. Or in the f***ing marching band. <laughs> this line possesses swagger that no one who has ever been in a marching band possesses. Corey gets a measure of revenge by slashing the bully kid's tires, but he doesn't even stay around at a distance to witness his reaction, which is the best part of slashing someone's tires. Or so I'm told. This gentleman had an accident, 
and needs a little fix up. Jesus Christ, Allison has some of the most immediate I want to bone you eyes that have ever immediated. All from a side profile of the guy her eyes want to bone. You shouldn't let that guy talk to you like that. It's gonna make you sad even if you don't think it does. Mansplaining toxic masculinity. You know, you need to find someone that can let go. That makes you want to rip off your shirt and show grief your f***ing tits and say, you know what? Let's go. My parents didn't name me grief as a child. How much f***ing marinara do you have to have all over your mouth to get this much on your glass of milk? Do napkins not exist in Haddonfield? Also, drinking milk with Italian food. Who's that person you're texting? Movie spends entirely too much time on Corey and Allison's burgeoning romance, and not enough ending the Halloween. Boys who keep secrets don't get custard for dessert. F*** you, Joan. That's not how it goes. It's... If you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding! How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? Stand still, laddie! There might be more appearances and Halloween ends of this industrial grinder than there are appearances of Michael Myers. I'm sorry to buy you this sh My goddamn son drove three miles on a f***ing flat. How are you bothering the auto shop guy with fixing a car when that's his exact business? It's like the movie wanted to continue the theme of people being shitty to people and every chance that characters get, they throw extra needles into the needling, like Terry's dad does here. This movie really wants to be Stephen King's It, from a sewer-dwelling Michael who hasn't resurfaced for a few years right down to the mysterious brain worms infecting the people of the town that have been awakened by his presence. My niece gave me a Rosetta Stone and now I'm learning Japanese. Shatsu o Nakushita. What does that mean? I believe it is Japanese for skip. This store is seriously understocked in the Diet Dr. Pepper department and that is some terrible stocking priorities. Do you see what he did to my sister? I'm sorry, there is absolutely no way this woman is alive. Michael smashed a fluorescent bulb and stuck the sharp end directly into her neck. I don't know how you stop that kind of blood loss or get medical attention in time, especially since she lived in the same boondocks where Lori lived. You were her neighbor? And you don't even know her name, do you? Giving sh to a traumatized introvert for being an introvert. You tempted and you provoked that man when you should have left him alone. Is this honestly a narrative someone would come up with after the story of the mad doctor who idolized Michael set him free in the first movie? I guess it is, considering the movie's theme that everyone is a dickwad now. I would like to see those cherry blossoms. Requesting to see someone's cherry blossoms in a parking lot. This terrible dancing goes on for all the some time. I know what it's like to have everybody looking at you thinking that they know you. Jesus Christ, man, did this movie franchise just turn into Riverdale? The first ever Halloween wasn't big on lots of murders until the third act, but at least Michael showed up to stalk people and make his presence felt. There was a sense of danger in every frame of the movie. The only threat this movie poses is to put me to sleep. Corey! How the f*** did they know that was Corey from behind? There you are, man. I've been looking for you. Only in 2022 and beyond could people from the f***ing marching band be the lead bullies in a film. I'm not sure if that's a step forward or a step back. Nor do I care. I didn't push nobody. He fell. God damn it, are they actually attempting irony here? For f***'s sake, man, I brought my kids to this. I don't want to have to explain irony to them. What's even more ludicrous than Michael having hung out in a sewer for the last four years is that he's still wearing his mask. Stand back, guys. This is where Michael chokes someone to death to read their mind and determine if they're worthy. McDonald's. He take people in there now and then. Why'd he let you live? Because he had evil eyes, random homeless guy. Don't you know about the evil eyes? They've only been talking about the evil eyes in this franchise for the last 44 goddamn years. This asshole throws the murder weapon like his fingerprints won't give him away when they find this shit. He's been processed through the system, dude. Not expecting someone to be thinking rationally when they commit their second accidental murder, but I am asking them not to be stupid. Oh. Oh. what? Not even the current Michael Myers is that stealthy. The f did this f come from? I killed someone. That is the strangest way of saying I'm sorry that I've ever heard. Also, this works. They would have felt for him. They would have helped him heal. But because your boogeyman disappeared, they needed a new one. Man, the things this town keeps blaming Lori for keep getting more and more ridiculous. Has Joan seriously been blaming Lori for her son's troubles for the last four years? I guess people cope how they cope, but that doesn't make this forced conflict any less of an illogical leap. Also, I wonder if when John Carpenter and Deborah Hill were writing the Boogeyman dialogue for Tommy Doyle's character in the original Halloween, they were thinking, I bet Boogeyman becomes the most overused word in this franchise for the next 40 plus f***ing years. I'm sorry. That's it. She went to Corey's mother's house and blah, blah, nothing happens, blah. She gets basically the same lecture the lady in the grocery store parking lot gave her, and now she's leaving? The hell is the point of that sh Why not leave? Why stay? All my memories are here. You're right, Allison. Nobody who has memories in one place could possibly move somewhere else. I'm not afraid of these people. 
I'm not afraid anymore. As if Corey needed immediate proof of his new outlook, Allison's asshole ex-boyfriend just happens to show up drunk and somewhat aggressive so that Corey can confront him like he's Clark Kent in Superman 2. Just burn it all to the ground. I get that Allison might have some Bonnie and Clyde fantasy buried deep within. She and her boyfriend in Halloween 2018 went to the dance dressed as the killer duo. But I'm not buying that Allison would go from just trying to live my life, get a promotion at work, be there for my grandmother, to let's just burn Haddonfield to the fucking ground and piss all over it within a few days of meeting Corey. Also, sitting on the same side of the table with the person you came to eat with when no one else is sitting at the table. I don't care if you're dating or even married, it's fucking weird. Cut to 28 seconds of emo bike riding and I would like Halloween to end right now. Can we make that happen? Can we roll the credits? I've got a doctor's note. Can we come in? Another night. Oh, f*** you, Corey. What have you got better to do? Another visit to the Michael Myers tunnel? Oh, I guess that's exactly what you had to do, but f***ing why? God damn this movie. Hey! You know, f*** Doug Mulaney! Doug Mulaney is possibly the most ridiculous murder fodder ever written for this franchise. He trumps Tina's boyfriend Mike from part five, Alice the unfortunate next door babysitter in the first part two, and of course Halloween 4's Bucky, the technician that was just trying to keep the Haddonfield power plant running. Poor Bucky. I guess Corey just knows for a fact that Michael won't kill him the second time he walks into the tunnel and also somehow communicates to Michael that another victim would be in shortly and he could have at him. And that f***ing worked? What? Corey, I'm pretty sure Michael didn't tag you in. There are rules to tag team combat, Corey. Rules! Show me how to do it. <laughs> Also, I'm kind of disappointed we haven't seen Corey out here in the sewer getting lessons like Uma Thurman and Kill Bill. So this is a darkly lit scene and the subtitles say Michael's breathing shakily, which you can barely hear under the f***ing classic Halloween theme. And while I love that theme, it would be nice to actually see and hear Michael's battle with old age and health issues, rather than being covered up with darkness in the movie score. Also, it would not be nice to actually see and hear Michael's battle with old age and health issues. Who the f*** wants to see that? Going along with the movie's theme, it would have been natural to reveal Corey as a new surprise Michael by the end of it all. In the absence of Michael, someone took his place. I imagine most of the same stuff in this movie happening, but with a lot more slasher deaths, people who just happen to have connections to Corey and later Allison. The audience thinks Michael's back, because why not? Then you drop the Corey reveal on him, and then we as CinemaSins would send the f*** out of that movie. Also, also, the homeless guy from earlier was saying that Michael takes bodies in the tunnels sometimes, which means he's been killing other people for the past four years. So why isn't he already back to full strength? And where are these bodies that's been piling up in the tunnel? Is he f***ing eating his victims now? Also times three. I guess the more Michael stabs, the more life comes to him? Is this like Dracula, only blood gets spilt on the floor instead of coursing through Dracula's veins? Is Corey his Renfield? How did Michael know Corey was going to Lori's house? Or that he was seeing Allison. Or that Allison and Lori live together. Has Michael been stalking them for the last four years and just choosing not to attack? I no longer understand anything. I'm starting to miss the simplicity of the white horses metaphor in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I'm missing the goddamn white horses Halloween end. See what you've done? Can Lori seriously not see Michael walking away? She's looking directly at where he was less than two seconds after he left. Imagine if your grandmother had fallen in love with Michael Myers. Imagine having a friend or co-worker turning your traumatic past into shitty anecdotes for her own amusement. F***ing nurse Deb. See the way people avoided him or how they made faces behind his back, which if I'm honest, pissed me off. Because I felt like they took my pain, my despair, and they made it about them. This is a great line. Now imagine this in a good movie. Unfortunately, they sandwich this great moment in with some second-rate Badlands and a Michael Myers that is completely inconsistent with how he's been for the last two films in this trilogy. I always appreciate the big swings, but just because you make a big swing doesn't mean you always connect. And he looks at me, and it's not him. At least not in the eyes. What a f***ing massive mistake these people are making by simply reading into what Corey's eyes look like. I mean, sure, they're right. This isn't anything you can actually determine just by feeling it. They're making the mistake that Lori warned about while writing her memoirs, and I don't think the movie is going to take them to task for it. Did the town do this to him after the accident? Or was it always there? Don't know. Gotta leave now without saying anything. So ends my internal monologue. Mind if I... Bedroom's down the hall. Clean up, take a shower. Is she not already cleaned up? Was she wearing the dress under her scrubs at work today? Dr. Mathis? Corey is stabbing Dr. Mathis in the background as Nurse Deb walks out, and maybe Dr. Mathis has reached a point where he can't scream anymore, but stabbing someone isn't exactly silent, especially from that distance. Failing at the attempt to be like Mike, the actual Michael Myers comes out of nowhere in a bad cleanup. I don't know how they communicated this arrangement, but yay! Slashin's back. Please don't do the head tilt. Please don't do the head tilt. Damn it! She teased the man with brain damage and then he snapped.
Seriously, I want to know how this story became the prominent narrative surrounding Michael's escape that was made possible by the doctor in the 2018 movie. And is anybody going to blame Tommy Doyle now that he's dead and can't call up a posse to come after anyone who dares bring it up? I can smell her on you. Mothers who smell their grown children. Awesome. Lori walked into this house where Corey is sleeping and thought, what's the most random annoying way possible I can wake this kid up? Did Lori know about the paper plane significance on the night Corey was babysitting Jeremy? Because based on this evidence, she must. And it's super f***ed up that she's doing this. She knows something's up with Corey, but she doesn't know he's a full-on murderer yet. Feels like she's poking the bear a bit here when she doesn't need to. You secretly hope Michael comes back for you. That's actually why the majority of us are watching this movie, but we're an hour and 13 minutes in, so I guess we all lose? I'm the psycho. You're the freak show. How the f*** did Lori get up from this chair, which is leaning against the wall, and disappear without a sound? It's here where I imagine an alternate universe where Corey looks up sooner than he does, and catches Lori quietly getting off the chair and tiptoeing to the next room, but comically stopping mid-tiptoe when she's caught. That's right. Meanwhile, back at the hospital where Allison works, nobody seems to care that a primary doctor and the recently promoted nurse were brutally murdered or turned up missing in the last day or two. Also, we have Allison's ex dead, her boss dead, and her co-worker who got promoted over her dead or missing, and absolutely no one seems to be concerned about it. You got something I need. That something Corey needs is Michael's mask. Now, in the last four years, the legend of Michael Myers should be known nationwide. How many people died in the last two movies all in one day and night? That mask would be sold like the ghost face mask at this point. Corey doesn't need to steal Michael's. Unless the podcaster was f***ing right about the mask in that first movie. Please don't tell me the podcaster was f***ing right in that first movie. What are you gonna do now? Probably randomly showing up at Lori's house again at the exact moment Corey is there and put the mask back on so we get a random fight with Lori for a few minutes and then a death by industrial grinder. It will have a striking score and a kumbaya moment that is both cheesy and insulting along with the town showing up with their metaphorical pitchforks. You will feel like something big and grand has happened but you will know in your heart that it is not. It's kind of amazing that Corey decided to become a serial killer like Michael Myers and on that very day the bullies went to the exact same gas station from earlier in the movie so that it could do the equivalent of rhyming couplets. Also, once upon a time Corey f***ed up these bullies beer run. Now he's snapped and f***ed up Billy's LeBaron. Confession, it's actually Terry's LeBaron, but that f***s everything up, so I gave the car to his friend, and actually, it's probably not a LeBaron, but Terry calls it a little Baron, and that f***s even more up, but I'm not going back! See the same thing in him that I saw in Michael? Michael. It's weird Louie wouldn't start with Corey telling her if he couldn't have Allison, no one would when confronting her granddaughter. Maybe that wouldn't work either, but it probably has a lot more of a chance than the comparing him to Michael Myers nonsense. Because of the hysteria that you caused when I trusted you, my friends are dead. Where is this coming from? If the movies are trying to paint a picture that Lori is even partly to blame for Michael's rampage, it failed. In the first movie, Lori warned people that Michael could come back, but she did not taunt him or any such f***ing thing. But that podcaster dude sure did. And in Halloween Kills, she was in a hospital bed nearly the whole time, even unconscious for lots of it. In Halloween, Allison was in the police car when she saw Dr. Sartain kill a cop pretended to be Michael and expressed regret that people wanted to kill him. Maybe Allison is just lashing out and she doesn't mean it, but this is yet another chance for me to ask, why does Dr. Sartain get absolved of all the blame? If you show the underrated gem hard target at any time in a movie, I should remove a sin, so I think I'll add two instead. Plus he's watching it on his laptop, f this guy. Wait, what are you trying to do, man? Suck your own- Give me a f***ing break. Since when does Corey have the kind of stealth where he can stab someone in the face in a nearby car and no one hears a f***ing thing? One minor aspect of this movie that I've enjoyed so far is that Corey isn't good at Michael Myersing yet. And now, after a couple days, he's suddenly amazing at it. There's so many possibilities to run and hide in this dump, but Margot and Stacy decide to just stay in the tow truck's path and run straight. They too are graduates of the Prometheus School of running away from things. Oh my god! Oh I understand the need to help your friend, but you do know that someone drove that truck over her a minute ago and is still in said truck, correct? This is not a Christine situation here, but even if it was, stay a fucking way! Motherfucker went through all that trouble to get Michael's mask and now he's just standing there holding it like he's Andrew Garfield in The Amazing Spider-Man. I got it, you f***ing psycho! I do not expect Terry to be smart, and I don't expect Corey's mom's boyfriend to be smart, but this scene is just too f***ing dumb. And there goes impossibly vanishing Corey again. Margo! How the f*** is Margo still alive? A chain link fence would not protect her from tow truck tires driving over her. Stacy's dead. You're dead too. She says this instead of, Terry look out, or Terry behind you, or Terry I've always hated you, see you in hell dick. Songs for the resurrection. No thanks. I saw that Halloween movie back in 2002 and I'm in no mood for songs about it. People reading Hustler or really any magazine in 2022.
Can I help you? You had Diana Prince, AKA Darcy, the male girl, and we don't get to see her till an hour and 23 minutes into the movie? For shame, Halloween ends, for shame. I'm glad the movie finally got to all the killing. I'm now beginning to wonder where Corey got all the strength all of a sudden. Are they really saying a mask stolen out of a hardware store in 1978 has mystical strength properties? Is this the point where the movie is saying the podcaster was f***ing right? Allison has Lori stored in her phone by her name rather than grandma. Did you really think I'd kill myself? Well, no, not really. But I'm not sure why you went through the trouble of making it look like you killed yourself unless it was just for the audience to go, oh no! It does virtually nothing for the situation. I don't know how the element of surprise helps you here, especially when you waste the initial shock on a one-liner. This f***ing muffler that shouldn't even be rattling anymore since Allison brought it to the shop to get it fixed is still f***ing rattling and becoming Halloween End's own personal Wilhelm scream. I feel like this would actually be pretty easy for Lori to explain, especially with the way Corey is dressed and the Michael Myers mask being at the scene. Not to mention that Allison will soon find out about the other murders that Corey committed. It's not really the gotcha moment that the movie seems to think it is. <laughs> I guess Lori didn't die a hero and live long enough to be the villain. You! You. It's wild to me that whenever a door is left open, Lori always assumes it's Michael Myers and she's almost always right. Does he seriously not know how to shut a door so his presence isn't automatically known? God damn it! Michael's just been hiding out this whole time? How? And huh? And how? What I think I find irritating about this final battle of the trilogy is the fact that it being Halloween is so arbitrary to the preceding hour and 32 minutes. It's like those random mentions of it actually being Friday the 13th in a Friday the 13th film. At this point, who the f cares? Allison, where's Lori? We're responding to a call. She called in a suicide. And Lori told you the exact address and everything. Why the f*** are you calling Allison to ask where Lori is? And how are the police not already at Lori's house? How f***ing big could Haddonfield possibly be? Hmm, if a five alarm blaze in my kill basement didn't work in the first movie, that must mean that a fire extinguisher will work. Lori's attempt to go full irreversible on Michael Myers doesn't work, but I really don't know what the plan was here. She very calmly and confidently walked into the kitchen, started cooking a microwave dinner, and went into a closet actually thinking a fire extinguisher was going to get her out of this. Whenever Michael or Corey step on someone's face or neck, they crush it immediately. What makes Lori's neck that much stronger than the rest of Haddonfield? Is she doing neck exercises every morning in case this happens? When you think the wells run dry on callbacks, the movie gods bless us with a sewing needle. Or I think that's how the expression goes. Either way, it's bullshit. <laughs> so it looks like they need to start calling Michael Myers, my chill Myers. Let's see what this movie's done to me. I love how the final battle between Laurie and Michael is not much more exciting than a throwaway WWE Tuesday night fight. Also, movie goes full Halloween H2O on the Laurie versus Michael battle at the end. I'm halfway surprised she doesn't drive him to the side of the road and hit him with a shovel. Do it. Do it! Do what? Go back and do a Rocky Four style montage of past Halloween hits? How the f*** did Allison get here before the cops did? Where the hell's Frank? He's at home washing his tights! This is not how it works. It is tonight. This motherfucker has no goddamn clue what has happened up to this point, but he is on board immediately. I'm not saying Michael Myers doesn't deserve all this and more, but could you maybe ask a few questions before the town industrial grinding is approved? Traffic. This place is an active crime scene from earlier in the night, but sure, let's also make it where hundreds of people stomp all over it to watch the death of Michael Myers. Like, can't find some other crushing machine around town. Besides, the mask is the power, not the man. I think. I honestly don't know anymore. Also, did they just pass all the dead bodies at the front of the dump from earlier tonight? Were they just like, yeah, those bodies probably need attention, but let's make sure we take care of throwing a corpse in an industrial grinder first. It's amazing how you keep thinking you've seen the most ludicrous thing in this movie, and then the Michael Myers crowd surfing scene comes right in the last couple of minutes and asks you to hold its butcher knife. What an incredible story of survival through decades of disturbances in our local community. Once again, people talk about Michael Myers' decades of disturbance, but this is simply not the case in this particular series of films. Michael had a 40-year period where he was in an institution. He wasn't doing a Halloween 2 through Halloween resurrection amount of killing or disturbances. I've said goodbye to my boogeyman, but the truth is evil doesn't die. Man, Lori took just enough time to write this self-help memoir for Michael to die, become a national sensation again, and tremendously boost the sales of a book that had basically no chance to sell much before all this happened. Enjoy. Gifting vegetables. What was it you were saying about those cherry blossoms? Was it skip? I think it was skip. I hope it was skip. I just liked Halloween Ends so much, I'm starting to like Halloween Kills, and I don't even know how to begin forgiving you for that Halloween Ends. Guess that was your accomplice in the wood chipper. Can we make 
jack-o'-lanterns. When you're a little kid, you're a little bit of everything. What do you think? This is like, this is the ugliest car I've ever seen in my life. It looks great on you. I'm sure it does, but I'm not going. Carpe diem, okay? You look hot in it. Every pregnancy is different. Every pregnancy is unique, right? Your vagina is not the same as room 207. This guy <laughs> up the LeBaron. Yeah. Dollar store designer friends. Oh. You look so f***ing hot at the office. You had me at hello. You had me at hello. They say if you lie between two of the main wires, your body just evaporates. You become a gas. I don't want them to gain another yard. You blitz all night!